Okay, so let's start. It's uh, really a pleasure today to have here CIAV. CIAV is an uh, um, Italian company specialized in document management and digital processes. And uh, basically, they are coming here to uh, give us a talk about how to go from source code, from code to real production. So this is really an interesting talk from an engineering point of view. Uh, I'm really happy to welcome here the uh, CIAV team, Paolo Rolle, Gianmaria Lombardato, and uh, Giorgia uh, Corro. And uh, I think it's better if uh, I leave the stage to, to them. So you are going to talk first? Yes, to present the company. Yes. So. Oh my God, I forgot. Sorry, guys. Yeah, there is always one piece missing. Okay. Slides. Because I'm the host on this side. And eventually. We should. We are ready to go. Oh, okay. Okay. Thank you. Good morning to everybody. Uh, I am uh, Giorgio Corro and uh, I work uh, in uh, HR department uh, in CIAV. CIAV is a software house specialized in document management and digital pros processes management. Uh, CIAV uh, wants to be uh, recognized as a company that designs, develops, and deals innovative software products, um, consultancy services, and outsourcing for digital processes. Uh, CIAV also wants to be recognized as a synonym of innovation and ease of use in the transformation of information into knowledge. Uh, our values are innovation, commitment, enthusiasm, and a customer first sense of responsibility. Um, the realization of our products is based on a global approach. 
In fact, uh, we have uh, our employees that are also uh, expert archivists and consultants uh, dedicated to create tailor-made uh, solutions in order to ensure the success of our products and uh, in order to use the most advanced technologies. Now, uh, here, you can see uh, represented our uh, products um, named uh, Archiflow, Syloge, uh, Smart Desk, and Catflow. So uh, let's talk about uh, the group. Uh, our headquarters is uh, in Padua, but we have also units and branches in Padua, Milan, uh, Roma, uh, Bologna, and Genoa. And uh, uh, here there is uh, a representation of our most important uh, departments. Every year, uh, our company offers uh, um, technical training uh, as a certification training, but also uh, the soft skills training. And uh, uh, finally, every year we offer team building experiences. Here you can see represented some, some of our business customers. Uh, but we have also um, important collaboration uh, with the uh, corporation and the univer university as uh, the University of uh, uh, Padua. So let's talk about uh, our uh, most important departments, uh, technical departments, but also our career paths. Uh, we have uh, a delivery uh, department that uh, is very important because it provides services in order to deploy product and services that are developed or resold by our company. The heart of our company is the software development department that uh, uh, is responsible for the development or the, or the maintenance of all our products. We have also a very important uh, um, quality assurance department that is important because it uh, guarantees the quality of our product and also is important because of uh, uh, our certifications. Uh, we have uh, an important help desk department that uh, is responsible to provide uh, customer support and uh, an R&D department seeking for solutions in order to improve production processes. So let's take a look about uh, all our uh, career opportunities. We have uh, career opportunities uh, in uh, all over Italy. But uh, we invite you to keep in touch with us uh, with uh, uh, taking a look uh, of um, our site, but also to write uh, um, us uh, using this uh, email address. Thank you for your, att your attention. And uh, I invite you to... Uh, um, I invite you to the lesson, uh, Gian Maria Romanato, CTO in SIAV, and Auro Rolle, that is a Quality Assurance Manager in SIAV. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Gianmaria Romanato. Friends call me Gianna. Uh, I'm with CF, and today with my colleague Auro, who will 
show up on, on stage a little bit later. We are going to discuss with you uh, about the path that we have to follow to take our source code to production. Uh, <clears throat> production here in the context of software development means uh, deploying the final application and making it available to the end users. So today we are discussing about the steps we need to follow, starting from the source uh, up to the moment where the application is ready for the end users. The agenda for today is this that you can see on screen. The presentation is split in five sections. The first one is a, a little game about the importance of having good quality source code. But we will also conclude that good quality source code is just the beginning. Uh, and that there is a lot of work to be done before the application is really ready for production. Then the main focus of uh, this presentation is probably in topics four and five, uh, performance tests with Apache JMeter and telemetry. But to be able to understand those sections, we need to spend some words on microservices and deployment possibilities. So section two and three are there to give you some basic understandings of some concepts that will be needed to follow section four and five more easily. And we need to discuss about these topics because in section four and five, we are presenting, uh, Aura will be presenting the approach to uh, performance tests in CF for the um, CLJ product. CLJ is built as a microservices application, which has certain implications uh, in testing and deployment. So in section two and three, we will discuss briefly these topics. Okay, so when is source code production ready? That, that's a good question. So uh, I'm showing you on the screen a simple servlet. I know you implemented servlets as part of this course. So this is a simple servlet to download files. In line 18, we see that the code is taking an input parameter coming with the request, which is the path to the file to be downloaded. And later, the code opens uh, a stream to read the file and streams the content of the file back to the caller by writing into the response. It works. I can assure you that this code compiles and works, yet it's far from perfect. So can you spot the problems in this code? Please? The is not okay. Others? If the file doesn't exist, you have to tell you that about that. Correct. So there are many problems in this code. Anyone else? It reads uh, the input file uh, byte by byte by byte. The uh, file. Uh, yeah, yeah, I got it. Each time and uh, write uh, one at time. Yeah, we, which could be a performance problem. There is, there is no buffering, let's say. Yeah. So, okay, we, we already have three contributions. Can you find something more? Abort. We have some gadgets no? for those who provide good answers to this question. So, it's simple. Simple present from 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 Seattle water bottle. So one for you. Thanks. I have a few more because there are good additional uh, um, problems in this code. So if anyone can spot an issue, I I would be happy to thank you. To give you a water bottle in return. Okay, uh, let's move on. So, um, there are programs on the market that help you understand if your code is good enough. That's called static code analysis. Sonar, Sonar Cube is one of these softwares that reads your code as you write it and highlights potential issues. So for example, 
Mm, all your comments were good, but there are two major issues that none of you spotted in, in this source. And Sonar would highlight this by reading the code. If one of them is that you might remember that servlets are uh, singletons. So there is only one instance of this object uh, in, in Tomcat, for example. I, and if two concurrent calls reach the servlet at the same time, we need to make sure that the code is thread safe. And this is not thread safe because we are saving the path in a file variable, which is defined at the class level. So it will be shared by all requests reaching the servlet at the same time. Uh, Sonar will tell us that we need to remove the misleading mutable servlet instance field or make it static and or final. Final would be a fix, but wouldn't work here because we need to populate the variable. So the only way is to move the file into the body of the servlet. That was intentional uh, put there to test you, let's say. And uh, another one is that we are not closing the file. We are not closing the file stream, so we are leaking operating system level resources, also reported by Sonar. Okay. In an operating system, there is only a given number of files that can be open. And if we do not close and release the file back to the operating system, then call after call, we will be leaking these resources, and then the program will start to fail because it cannot open any more files. In reality, there are additional errors. So um, it's a security issue here, a path traversal issue, because you know the caller might request any file on the file system. Uh, potentially the password file in the Linux server. And we said we are leaking resources. There is generally very poor error handling, uh, as noted. So if we for example, if the path parameter is null, we will get a null pointer exception. Or if the file is not readable or not existing, we will also get a runtime error, which will be reported as a 500 HTTP internal error to the caller, who, who will have no clue about what went wrong. And uh, performance, as properly noted, we should be buffering here and not read one byte at a time. So maybe a better version of the servlet could be this one. I don't want to waste too much time. But just to point out that in 20 lines of code, there can be six, seven errors and some very serious one ranging from security to performance, thread safety, problems that would be extremely difficult, especially the thread safety issue to diagnose during development. Uh, you can only understand that you have that issues either if you know what you're writing or if you test carefully your application at runtime. And so it doesn't matter how much time we spend uh, in source code, trying to write source code and whether we use or we don't use tools like SonarCube that can help us identify ahead of time potential issues or bad practices in our code. Still, we will not be able to answer this type of question. So how many users can we serve with our application uh, uh, with a given hardware configuration? If we want to go live with the software and open the application to the end users, how can we tell how much hardware we need for supporting our expected user base? So sure, we can run the application on our station, maybe time with the clock, how long it takes to serve one of our requests and make some reasoning around it. But how much RAM will Tomcat need to serve 100 users or how many CPUs, how fast the disk drive has to be to be able to stream files back to our users. No, it's a very simple piece of code, 20 lines in total, yet, we cannot tell any of these answers unless we first collect some measures and we analyze the behavior of our application at some time, which is what we are going to discuss later as part of the performance 
testing session, section of this session. So key takeaway from this first section of the presentations are that we have to write good code, that's super important, but that's not enough. We need to test the application, take measures and get ready for production. Any questions so far about this? Cool, let's continue. Uh, please feel free to interrupt me if you have any questions or I'm not clear. Microservices architecture. So you all know uh, what a client server application is, right? Uh, we have a server, uh, we might have a client which could be a browser. So the browser at some point invokes remote services offered by the remote server application, uh, maybe RESTful services over HTTP consumed by means of an AJAX call within some JavaScript uh, on the client side, right? So <clears throat> let's take the Amazon shop as an example, okay? We can simplify, oversimplify, and we can think that Amazon is essentially three pieces. It's a product catalog where we search for products, uh, read characteristics, check reviews, check price, make our choices. At some point when we found what we were looking for, we will be adding the product to the shopping cart, one or more products. And eventually, if we really want to buy this stuff, then we will proceed to the checkout and use the payment system to conclude the purchase, right? So uh, if we imagine the Amazon shop as a monolith application, uh, it should provide at minimum this basic functionality, searching for products, viewing product details, adding and removing items to the shopping cart and viewing the full content of the cart, maybe the total amount and then proceeding to the payment, right? What if, of course, there will be other functionalities at minimum a login screen, a logout button, the possibility to specify my uh, shipping address, my email address, phone number, whatever, but at minimum, the smallest possible online shop will need to provide the functionality in black, in addition, of course, to login and logout. Now, if we imagine this split into a microservices application, then we could split the functionality logically by domain. So we might have uh, one smaller application that is just the product catalog, which will provide the search and view functionality. We might have uh, another small application, which is just the shopping cart. And finally, a third one, which is the payment gateway. And to hide this additional complexity to the client, we will typically put in front of this system, a gateway. So the client will believe to be calling the three and three six functions on the gateway server. But in reality, the gateway will forward the request to the appropriate smaller microservice application, which is there even though not feasible directly to the client. And when we split one monolith into microservices, we need to think that each of them is a separate application with, with its own database and that we're also splitting responsibilities and data. So the product catalog is responsible for having, let's say the database with all the products that Amazon is selling and their prices and maybe uh, how many of them we have in stock and we can sell. Uh, the, the shopping cart is just managing uh, the items that I choose to buy and the payment gateway is finally just performing the actual payment. Then it's clear that because we separated the data, when we pay, the payment system needs to know the total amount. And for this, it will need to call the, the shopping cart. And the shopping cart doesn't own the data for the 
items. So to get the unit price of each of the products in the cart, the shopping cart will need to call the product catalog microservice. So what does this mean? Well, we, we split the application into more smaller pieces and we will discuss maybe why this might be a good idea. But at the same time, this has implications for us. We need two more services that we didn't need before. And we have now three applications to develop and maintain as opposed to only one. Maybe the amount of code is more or less the same, but you know, it's three items to deploy. It's three different build jobs. There is more complexity, you know? On the other hand, we have advantages. Uh, I guess we all agree in our experience with the Amazon shop that we spend most of the time on the catalog. Uh, after spending a lot of time on the catalog, we move items to the cart and later we conclude very quickly the purchase, right? So Amazon probably needs to have more hardware available for serving the users who are working on the catalog. So splitting one monolith application into three smaller pieces allows us to use in a different way the hardware. We can deploy the microservice for the product catalog on more powerful hardware because it's where most of the, uh, it's where users will spend most of the time. So it's the microservice that will receive the more requests per unit of time. Uh, the shopping cart is probably the second in terms of traffic and the payment gateway maybe is the one who will get uh, the least number of requests and therefore the one to whom we can dedicate the least hardware. So by choosing, by splitting the application in, in more pieces, we can apply different strategies in the allocations of hardware. And for big application, this might be an advantage because we can optimize the way we use hardware rather than sizing everything for the worst case scenario of a monolith application. Uh, on the other hand, we are bringing to ourselves uh, a lot more complexity uh, th than before. But there is also another important advantage. You know, if, for example, uh, we discover uh, a very uh, problematic issue in the payment gateway and maybe something so bad that we might uh, not really charge our users for the purchase and give out products for free. You know? That would be very bad for us. So we would like to take that service offline. If it was a monolith application, that would mean immediately stopping everything for all the users. The moment we split the Amazon shop in three apps and one of them is the payment gateway. If we find a problematic issue in the payment gateway, we can switch off the payment gateway and people will still be able to browse the catalog and add items to the cart. Maybe we will show them a banner in the web interface which says today from hour to hour, uh, payment gateway is offline so you cannot conclude your purchase but you can still spend time on the catalog. You can still add items to the shopping cart and maybe come back later when the payment gateway is back online to conclude your purchase, okay? So one application that is split into microservices might be more resilient than a monolith. If you have a problem, you can hopefully reduce the functional scope of the application by switching off that particular microservice and let user continue working on the remaining of the functionality that the application supports. So, well, there are advantages in microservices indeed. We can make better use of hardware. We can make our application more resilient. There are also important development and testing advantages because if all of us were the maintainers of these uh, uh, three microservices, we could split our seven smaller teams. Each of us might take responsibility of one of the microservices and each microservice might have an independent life cycle, be released when it's ready, when new features are there, be tested independently from each other. 
All of this is, is not possible if the application is a monolith because the code base is only one and we are building all the sources together. And if we want to roll out a small improvement in the shopping cart, in reality, we build everything and we have to roll out also the product catalog and the payment gateway, no? which also means we have to do more testing because everything is together. And before stopping the application and replacing it with a new one, we want to be pretty sure that we're not introducing uh, regressions or issues. If the application is split in microservices and we just touched one of them, we can roll out the update of that microservice independently from the others. And in this way, uh, there is less to test. We are changing a smaller portion of the overall system and we feel and are safer. <clears throat> Any questions here? Cool. Uh, we are now going to talk about deployment. So <clears throat> imagine we have this monolith application and we want to deploy it to production. The deployment to production of uh, an application gets more and more complex with a level of service that we want to provide to our users. Uh, if I'm doing an application for myself, I'm installing it on my computer. And if it crashes, too bad, I will reboot it. End of story. But if I'm giving my application to a small office that uses it every day for their business, <clears throat> it might be a problem if the application crashes for whatever reason. No? So I would like to give them a system that is more robust, more resilient. For example, even a very simple monolith application, uh, which needs to be at least fault tolerant, meaning that it doesn't, uh, it cannot allow uh, to have, it cannot have a single point of failure, would need to be uh, replicated in every uh, of its parts. So uh, if server one is our Tomcat server containing our application, we would need two of them so that if one of the two crashes for whatever reason, maybe because the hard drive fails on that computer, then there is at least another one that will be online and will be still serving our users. For security reasons, we will not want the application to be directly on the internet. Most likely there will be a firewall in front of it and an HTTP server such as Apache or Nginx. So even to deploy one simple application running in, in Tomcat, if we want it to be fault tolerant, we need at least to duplicate everything to Tomcats and to Apache. And then we have the data in the database. So we also want the database to be safe. Now the data is very important, of course. So normally, how do you do that? Well, one possible approach is to use two databases in a so-called active passive configuration. The application is using the active database, but the active database is pushing all the changes to the passive database. If the active database crashes, we switch the passive database to the active one and the application keeps on working with the other database. So even a very simple web app, if we really want to make it fault tolerant, would need an infrastructure like this. And what if for the client, it's super important that there is totally no um, blackout, no downtime, 99.999% uh, availability, the application is always online and we have to guarantee that it can resist to the worst possible scenario. Well, in, in that case, we are talking about high availability. And normally high availability is achieved by deploying the same application in two different geographical areas. So maybe I'm Bank of Italy, and I want to make sure that my business is not impacted, even if my data center um, is subject to a earthquake or a fire. So I deploy the application in, in two sites, 
uh, maybe in Rome and maybe another one in Milan, which is far enough. So, so that if we have a earthquake in Rome, Milan is most likely unaffected. And in this case, our simple monolith application is installed in two places. Maybe one of the two is, is smaller, a bit less resources because the secondary site will not be used in production in reality. The primary site will be used. We will be switching to the secondary site only if the first one fails due to a disaster like a, a earthquake or, or a fire. So we accept that in this extreme situation, the application might be slower for our users. As such, we um, create a secondary site which is smaller and with, with less hardware. So again, in this case, we want to provide high availability. We want an application that can survive a disaster. We need even more hardware, even more deployment complexity. Okay. And we are still talking about a monolith application, something that could be a simple web app running in Tomcat plus one relational database. So uh, this is Syllogy, one of the product in CF. It's a micro services application. Uh, all the boxes here represent different microservices. The blue ones are made by CF. The black ones are open source components from the market that we're using. And the number in, uh, in the circle is the minimum number of replicas that we need to have for each of the services if we want the system to be fault tolerant. Not necessarily highly available, but fault tolerant, okay? So we saw how complex can be to deploy one monolith application if we want it to be fault tolerant or even better, highly available. Imagine the complexity of deploying a microservices application that is made of all these pieces, each of them with their respective database schema and tables. Uh, I mean, uh, there is one more because Elasticsearch is missing here. Okay, so it's a lot of pieces. Okay, so <clears throat> how do system administrator try to manage all this complexity? Well, uh, one tool that is available to them is virtualization. Virtualization is when you uh, run, uh, yes? Uh, excuse me. The Please. number uh, of replicas depends on the uh, distribution of loads. Uh, I need, uh, the, I, I need uh, much higher replicas in, based on uh, the loads or... Uh, okay, know. yeah, it's a very good question. Thank you for the question. So there are many aspects that influence the number of replicas. For example, uh, we have a one close to the batch. In that case, batch is not a critical functionality. If it fails, the application will still keep on working. Uh, and maybe nobody will even notice uh, if the batch component is not working and the system administrator will fix the situation and nobody will notice. Uh, but for example, uh, this piece here, platform base, it's very important and it's a central point to the application. You will see that many of the errors end uh, directly or transitively into platform base. No? So if this guy fails, we have a cascade effect of failures. So in this case, two is important because we want to be on the safe side and we want to make sure that if one fails, not, uh, the whole application is not failing as well. And then of course there is load. Each of these has its own uh, different characteristics, different use cases, uh, different um, computation logic. And so we need to carefully determine uh, how much replica we will need for each of them, depending on the final user base. So the numbers you see here are for the minimum installation of a fault tolerant 
uh, installation of the application. But if we want to serve a large user base, we might need to ramp up all these values by a few units. And there are also some components which are designed to work in replica. For example, this guy here, Hazelcast or Apache RabbitMQ, these are systems which are designed to be fault tolerant in a way that if one system fails, the other will take over. And they are designed in a way that there is always one, let's say primary node in, in the replicas and secondary nodes. If uh, the election of the primary node is automatic. So you start the system and one of the nodes will perform really conceptually an election. So I will vote for that node, another node will vote for another node and one will be elected. Now for this process to work properly, you need at least three nodes because if you have two and each node votes for itself or for the other, you have two participants with an equal number of votes and you cannot elect the master. So certain system require three nodes minimum to make sure that one master is electable. Okay. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> so, uh, other questions? No. Okay. Virtualization. So virtualization is a, is a mechanism which allows us to run uh, virtual machines in virtualization hardware and, and software. Uh, for example, in this screen, we see Windows running uh, Ubuntu Linux uh, in a virtual machine powered by Oracle VirtualBox. Uh, on the desktop, this might be uh, a use case for someone who wants to try out Linux before installing on a real laptop. So they maybe run uh, VirtualBox, install Linux, play with Linux half a day, yeah? and then they say, yeah, it's cool, I want to try it out. Or maybe for someone working for a magazine who wants to review the latest version of Ubuntu Linux, rather than installing Ubuntu Linux uh, on, an, on a laptop, they just use uh, a virtual machine to test it and, and write a nice review of the new release of Ubuntu. But uh, uh, when it comes to production environments, virtualization is useful because it allows us to make a better use of resources and because it reduces the complexity uh, of maintaining the systems for our IP. For example, Say that I have two applications. Uh, each of them requires three weeks of run for working, right? Now I'm going to the hardware shop and I'm buying two hardware servers, one per application. It's very unlikely that I will find a hardware server which comes with three gigs of RAM. Now, usually it's a power of two. So most likely I will find four, eight, 16 gigs of RAM. No? So when I'm buying a hardware, server with four gigs of RAM for running my application that only needs three, I'm essentially over provisioning the, the, the hardware, the system with more resources than actually needed and I'm wasting one fourth of the RAM. Uh, when I use virtualization, I have a very big machine which has hundreds of CPU and hundreds or thousands of gigs of RAM and I create virtual machines using this pool of resources. So I'm not wasting any single gigabyte of RAM because if my application only needs three in a virtual system, I will create a virtual machine that is only given three gigs of RAM. Besides, our IT will only need to manage one bigger but only one system, no? So there is only one system to be monitored, patched, updated, secured, as opposed to having a large number of individual servers. So virtualization is both uh, useful for cost saving, but also for reducing the complexity of managing these resources, which is also of course cost saving because we save the time of our IT guys. Uh, but uh, virtualization comes with some significant overhead. Uh, in a virtualization system, you typically have 
uh, your hardware <coughs> and top of the hardware you have your host operating system and then you have a hypervisor uh, the hypervisor is the name of the layer of the software layer that manages the virtual machines and then you have the virtual machines themselves each of them like in the ubuntu on, on windows example each of them contains its operating system and then the libraries at the operating system level and finally maybe tomcat with our application now one killer feature of virtualization is that we can run multiple virtual machines and all of them are completely isolated and separated from each other so i could have different versions of the operating system different versions of the libraries and whatever is compatible or required by my app at the top and uh, without having to get crazy to make sure that all the apps can run on exactly the same operating system and library so this possibility to run separate and isolated environment is very convenient but at the same time we are paying a significant overhead because this nesting of operating system has some some cpu cost when when my app performs a call to the operating system to work with the file system in reality the hardware is here so the guest operating system behave believes to have a hard drive available but in reality it's a virtual hard drive that is managed by the hypervisor so the guest operating system makes the read operation on the hypervisor the hypervisor delegates the read operation on the host operating system and then we finally reach the hardware so all of this scaffolding and nesting of operating system in operating system implies overhead that we pay in terms of cpu so one application running in a virtual machine is typically a little bit slower than the same application running directly uh, on the operating system installed directly on the hardware and also the memory requirements are significant because we have the full memory footprint of the operating system of the virtual machine that needs to be accounted in addition to the memory needed by our application so for running our application in the blue box at the top in one virtual machine which is maybe ubuntu linux then we we are also paying the memory requirements of ubuntu linux itself that, that when it boots it typically takes maybe one gigas of ram just for itself and and that's why in more recent time containers have been created Containers are way more effective. Uh, in containers, we don't have the hypervisor. We don't have the guest operating system. It's a feature which is baked into the kernel of the Linux operating system. So Linux is able to run containers which are uh, isolated the same way applications would be, but they share the same kernel as the host operating system. So there is no overhead and from the application operating system point of view a container is comparable to a regular process there is no measurable overhead of a container running in linux versus the same application running directly in linux no measurable overhead so we save memory we save cpu and we use even better our resources now why are we talking about containers uh, this is an example of macOS running three Nginx containers, which is an HTTP server. Docker is an implementation, you might have heard of it. It's an implementation of container technology available for multiple operating systems. So uh, with Docker run Nginx, we are starting the Nginx container in Docker. With Docker PS, we see the running containers. More or less, Docker PS mimics the PS Unix command. And indeed, from the point of view of the operating system, containers are pretty much like processes rather than virtual machines, so much lighter. So containers are much better than virtual machines. They provide the same 
isolation that we have in virtual machine, we can have two applications on the same hardware, each of them with dedicated RAM and, and CPU, each of them maybe with different versions of Tomcat because they've been implemented in different moments. They will not mess with each other. One could be running on Java 8, one could be running on Java 11, no big deal. Everything is isolated into each container, but we are not paying significant overhead as it happens for the virtualization. However, we are saving a lot of CPU and RAM, but it's still very complex to deploy an application. So imagine CLOJ, which is made of many, many microservices, as we said, and say that we want to deploy it using containers. We will need servers where we'll, we'll be running the containers. We will need when two containers run in the same server and open maybe the same port, you know, that's not possible. Only one port, only one process can open, uh, for example, the port 80 or 8080 uh, on the operating system. So we would need to uh, uh, use different parts for the containers. We will need to make sure that containers can find each other over the network using maybe the DNS or the IP addresses. So we are saving memory, but we are not really saving from having to deal with a lot of complexity. And that's why orchestrators have been created. Uh, did any of you heard of Kubernetes before? Okay, no. So Kubernetes is a project that was created by Google in 2016. And it's a, a software for orchestrating managing containers. When Google created it, it knew it had something great in its hand and it wanted Kubernetes to be massively adopted by the industry. So not only it made open source, it made uh, Kubernetes open source, but it uh, contacted the Linux, Linux Foundation and together they created the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, which is the foundation that now supervises the development of Kubernetes and a lot of technologies related to cloud computing and orchestration in general. Now, how does uh, Kubernetes work? By the way, Kubernetes is a Greek word, which stands for captain, uh, captain, governor. So it's a nice touch from Google to, to choose this name. And it's often abbreviated K8S, where eight is the number of letters between the K and the S. So how does Kubernetes work? Well, you have a main server, the green one, and then you can have as many blue servers as, as you want. And the blue servers are for running your containers. In Kubernetes terminology, you don't call them containers, you call them pods. Uh, the pod might be more than one container together, but the minimum deployment unit is one pod containing one container. Okay, so when you read pod, imagine it's a container. So in Kubernetes, you can dedicate blue nodes, which are servers, to running the pods. And then you ask the, the master node to deploy your application, which is maybe made of 15, 20 pods. Kubernetes will distribute the pods on the available machines, making sure that they will fit with their needs in terms of CPU and RAM. So it's like a, if you say, it's like a Tetris player, no? Who has all these containers, each of them with uh, requiring a certain amount of RAM and a certain number of CPU cores. It has a number of blue nodes offering that much RAM and that many CPUs and it will distribute your pods, trying to make the best possible use of the hardware resources. And the nice feature is that not only it will distribute this for you, but it will also create virtual networks, which are called uh, namespaces. Virtual networks will be created for each application that you deploy. And it doesn't matter if some of your containers end up running in one server and some of your containers end up running in another. From the point of view of the virtual network, it's the same network. 
you don't need to change port numbers because these are all isolated. Even if these two containers both use port 80, you don't need to change one of the two to 81 to let them live together in the same blue Kubernetes node. All of this will be managed automatically by Kubernetes. And also, when it comes to, to change the number of replicas in Kubernetes, you will see the directory of your pods. You can go select one of them, which is maybe set to two replicas and change it to three or four or whatever. And Kubernetes will start other instances and run them wherever is appropriate and make them join the same virtual network where the, the others were running earlier. So it frees the system administrator from a lot of complexity. Why am I talking about all these concepts, virtualizations, containers, and Kubernetes? Because our application is built uh, uh, as a microservices application. Each microservice is shipped as a container, and we run it inside a Kubernetes runtime, which is basically a cluster of servers. Mm, I'm spending this time on this topic because now Auro will um, explain to you how we perform a performance test in our laboratory in, in Padova. And uh, we are using all these tools there. So it would be difficult for you to understand the next section if you didn't have a basic overview of these concepts. So the, the takeaways from this section is that uh, containers are more efficient than the virtual machines, but they do not reduce deployment complexity. We saw how complex can be to deploy a highly available monolith application. Imagine the complexity of a microservices application. Luckily for us, there exists on the market orchestrators and Kubernetes is the leading product at the moment, which uh, reduce largely this complexity and give us uh, a chance to focus more on our application and our tests rather than getting crazy solving deployment issues. And with this, uh, I invite my colleague Auro on stage. Oh, there is a question. Oh, sorry. Uh, in virtual machines, you can specify the hardware. So the apps in the virtual machine can't exceed the RAM on a specified CPU. Or... Is it the same in containers? Yes. So um, both in virtual machines, if I got the question right, both virtual machines and containers can be configured dedicating to them a given amount of RAM and a given number of CPUs taken from those are really available on the virtualization or orchestration system. So yeah, that, that, that's super important. Otherwise, Kubernetes wouldn't be able to schedule your containers on, on the right blue nodes. Because as I said, that, that, that's what I meant when I said it's like a Tetris player. You might have one application that needs three CPU uh, and another one that needs two. And maybe on one of the blue nodes, you only have two more CPUs available. So Kubernetes will fit there the container that needs two while and use all of the CPUs available in that blue node and, and move the other container that needs three CPU to another blue node where three CPUs are available. So it will arrange your stuff across uh, worker nodes to make the best use of the available hardware. Of course, for this to work, your containers must declare how much CPU they need and how much RAM uh, they need. And it's so smart that, for example, uh, I might have three blue nodes and I might be using only two. Maybe one of the two crashes uh, without me noticing, Kubernetes might silently move all the containers which were running in the crashed node 
to the other one that is available, redistribute them, reshuffle them. And if I have replicas, maybe the user don't even notice because one of the replicas crashed, but it was a few seconds later recreated on another node by Kubernetes uh, without us having to do anything. Okay. Hi all, I am uh, Auro Rolle and it is a pleasure for me to be here today as it was also my university more than 20 years ago. So now we will see uh, the performance testing uh, uh, process with Junita. To be honest, uh, this is uh, only one step uh, of uh, our um, quality assurance testing process, process. but it is uh, uh, the final one. I mean that uh, the process uh, has a lot of gates and uh, this is the final gate. If uh, we are here, we are quite sure that the application uh, could go uh, to production. I mean that uh, if this gate uh, will be passed, uh, the application is ready for production. We have to understand uh, now, oops. Stop. Yes. Okay. Yeah. We have to understand now uh, how many users uh, our application can serve, but uh, mm, also we have to uh, understand uh, uh, that uh, our uh, application it, it is only a part of the entire system because um, for uh, uh, this kind of activity. Um, is like if uh, we have to test a black box. Inside it is black box, this, there is the application, but uh, there is also the database and uh, a lot of other parts that uh, uh, <coughs> belongs to this kind of uh, system. Mm. So uh, we have to uh, simulate uh, a, a specific load on the system in terms of um, a set of limited business transaction. On the previous example, we, we uh, were seeing uh, uh, the cart of the Amazon application. The cart is uh, an example of a business trans transaction. Also the payment is uh, an, another example. Um, <laughs> the test is, uh, um, calling these uh, uh, transactions. And uh, uh, here, okay. okay. Okay, and uh, we, have, we have to find a way uh, to run this kind of test inside the, uh, um, the system that is uh, um, composed by a lot of uh, uh, pods. It is composed by Kubernetes that is able to manage these kind of pods. And uh, uh, inside this system, we have to put an additional container uh, that is able to uh, call, to make call, calls to these uh, particular pods that are managing this kind of uh, business transactions. Well, how we, we could do that? It is, uh, uh, I would say, complex because uh, um, first of all, uh, we have to uh, uh, install uh, the, the, the system in terms of uh, the deployment of all the pods. And at the end of the deployment process, we have also to uh, uh, add an additional container dedicated only uh, to the testing tool that is a JMeter. To do that, we use Jenkins. Jenkins is a, a continuous integration and continuous uh, delivery tools that is able to drive and to manage uh, Kubernetes, JMeter, and a lot of other uh, tools. 
um, we do this uh, developing code. I mean that uh, Jenkins is uh, able to run uh, Groovy scripts. So here, here we see uh, a set of points that are um, environment creation, uh, test script assembly. Why test script assembly? Because um, our scripts use, uh, uh, I would say, uh, libraries. I mean that uh, each pod, each application server uh, has a specific set of API inside. And uh, we are able to create uh, a library uh, related uh, and containing uh, all these kind of codes related to the APIs. So we can uh, have a library for the card, card, another library for the payment, and so on. The script is uh, um, using these uh, kind of libraries to uh, perform uh, a specific test. So there is a phase uh, on Jenkins that is able uh, to uh, combine these calls using uh, the defined libraries. After that, uh, uh, Jenkins is uh, pushing uh, inside the Kubernetes a new pod to run Jmeter. Uh, Jenkins is, is also uh, uh, the tool that we use to define uh, a specific load profile. What is a lot of profile? But you could imagine that uh, we have to decide how many users uh, are testing the application. For example, we could decide to run 100 users concurrently on our test, but this could be, I would say, enough or not, depending on the test result. So uh, we have also to try, uh, for example, maybe 200 to see if uh, the, um, the system is uh, uh, serving 200 users. But the um, right approach is different because we have to uh, define a specific load profile. And we have to uh, understand uh, in this profile, how many users uh, could uh, be uh, used in the test? How would you, how would you do that? Uh, it is uh, simple because if you look here, this is um, an example of a uh, uh, Jenkins script. Inside this uh, script, there are a lot of variables that could be used to define the profile. For example, the number of threads here, is defined the number of concurrent users. And another important parameter is the duration. This means that uh, if here we set uh, 100 users for, I don't know, 10 minutes, we are loading in the application 100 users concurrently for 10 minutes. And in this schema, we see that uh, Jenkins uh, is uh, able to put a new container on the system. And this new container, that is the Jmeter container, is loading the application concurrently with a lot of threads. In this example, 100 threads. Well, uh, Jmeter uh, is also um, uh, a tool that uh, has a graphic user interface. And we could uh, uh, see the load profile directly in Jmeter before run the test. Here we see exactly the, the profile that is our run starting from zero and going to 100 users after two minutes, more or less. After that, there is the duration. So in the end of the run, you will have always 100 users for 20 minutes. Okay, all this uh, part uh, is related to the uh, parameters 
because uh, the parameters are loaded uh, from Jenkins. Yeah. This, if you see, there is a function here that is loading the, the parameters from Jenkins. And here you see the libraries. Okay. This part is uh, related to the library. Solution is a, a specific part of our application and also configurator and pack manager. The script is uh, simply calling a specific API inside, for example, the solution library or the pack manager library. In this way, we are able to share these modules across a lot of different scripts. We don't have the need to create this part every time. Okay. And here we see the load profile definition. This point here is defining the run path. The run path is the amount of time in which all users are loaded on the application. If the run path is one minute, after one minute, you will have 100 users. And after that point, you uh, should see exactly the performance of, of your application. That means that the performance and uh, the, uh, the KPI of the system that uh, uh, we are looking for are found after the run path. Okay. Another point is uh, the thinking time and uh, thinking custom and thinking deviation. Usually uh, a real user is uh, 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 interacting with the application, putting some weight between an action and the other. If you are looking for a, I don't know, a specific uh, item on uh, Amazon, you could uh, just uh, read the page and after that, uh, search another item. But between the two search, the two click, uh, there are a lot of time, maybe minutes. So what will happen if uh, we don't put this kind of uh, uh, time between uh, two uh, clicks on the search, search function? Well, uh, maybe, we are uh, loading on the application uh, the amount of users that are not free. I mean that uh, maybe 100 users without thinking times correspond to 1,000 users, real users. I mean, so. If you look at the performance, we have also to consider this part because the KPI that uh, we will uh, uh, find is, is a measure of how many users we could load on the application. And so we have also to consider on our test uh, their thinking time and the amount of time between each call, each transaction. Okay. Here we are seeing a particular kind of process. It is the one that uh, we uh, use to uh, identify a specific point on the total transaction per second. Total transaction per second is a chart that is representing uh, how many search, for example, we are doing per second. On the load profile, we see that uh, 
at the beginning of the run, we are, we are having uh, five users. And at the end of the ramp, we are having 40, 50 users. But the total transaction per second is changing its derivatives here. When you see this kind of trend, you have found the TPR. I mean that this point corresponds to 10 users on the run. 10 users are the maximum number of users that we could serve on our system. If we, if we go uh, over this, uh, this number, the system uh, still uh, responds, but the response time is growing with the number of users. This is a, a critical uh, situation because, uh, for example, looking at the next slide, this chart is representing the response time. If you see in the first part, the response time is stable, uh, is completely stable. After 10 users, yeah, it is growing and growing and growing, always. And at the end, you see what we have. The response time is no more predictable because the system after this point will be unstable. The response time is not growing anymore with the number of the user. Some transaction is no more predictable. And there are a lot of deviations, you see? But, just another point, if you go with the law, in the end, we have crashes because uh, there is no way to serve more users. Okay. Questions? Okay, uh, now Gian Maria will. Uh, present at the trend, but just uh, uh, the latest point. Uh, I was saying that uh, the system is a black box. In reality, it is not. I mean that uh, for the performance test part is a black box, but uh, uh, we have the possibility to put probes inside the system. These kind of probes are the telemetry. And Gian Maria will uh, explain this part. Okay. Ten more minutes, right? Yes. Ten more minutes. Okay, so two concepts, observability and, and monitoring. When the application is live in production, we want to immediately be aware when something bad happens, like the application crashing or getting slower and slower. This is what we achieve using monitoring. Monitoring is when we put in place some automated mechanism that will maybe send us an email if the application crashes or uh, it gets slower and slower. Uh, but then once we know that something is not good, how do we understand what's happening inside the application? That's where we use uh, telemetry. Because telemetry makes the system observable, which, you know, uh, observability is the ability of a system to be observable, to understand what's happening internally when it's stimulated. Okay, so um, 
the pillars of observability are three uh, logs, which of course is something that we can introduce, we have to introduce ourselves in our code if we want the code to be production ready. But then traces, traces uh, allow us to understand what's happening end to end when somebody calls our application. So for example, it could be um, uh, the trace end to end could be the trace in the simple servlet we saw at the beginning from when we receive the call to when we serve the file back to the caller. Or in a microservices application, it's obviously more complex because there are interaction between the microservices and the traces uh, should be able to track that part as well. And metrics. Metrics is just measures of some dimension over time, how many invocations occurred on that particular servlet in, in the last minute, uh, how many errors did the application produce uh, in an hour. So um, today we will focus on traces, which is very uh, easy to achieve by means of open telemetry. Open Telemetry is an open source project developed at GitHub and sponsored and supervised by the same cloud native computing foundation that uh, hosts the development of Kubernetes itself. And uh, thanks to telemetry, we open telemetry, we can easily make our application um, observable. So uh, if we wanted to do this, programmatically by coding ourselves. We would need to change and insert uh, in our code several um, statements of code to collect telemetry information and to push them to a collector system. But uh, open telemetry allows us to produce telemetry information for our application without making uh, any change to the code. And this is great. So how does open telemetry work? Well, open telemetry is based on, on two ideas. The number one is that every modern application uses libraries or framework from the open source world. So for example, I'm running my servlet in Tomcat, or I'm using JDBC to query the database or Hibernate, for example. And because Java is a language which is not compiled to native code, you know that the Java compiler compiles to an intermediate representation, which is bytecode. And later at runtime, the Java virtual machine translates the bytecode into native code. Then there is the possibility to alter, manipulate the original application uh, bytecode of these open source components that we use so that they will automatically produce telemetry information for us. So this is what open telemetry does. And this is called instrumentation, the, the act of taking a binary and modifying it to a behavior. This is particularly easy to implement in Java because the binary is not really uh, a native executable for a specific CPU, but is an intermediate representation that later the virtual machine will translate. And uh, the bytecode is fully documented. There are even libraries on the market to read the bytecode of a source and see what's in there. That's how decompiler works for Java, for example. They read the bytecode of your class and understand that there are five methods, that within the first method there is a for loop. So open telemetry will modify Tomcat, Hibernate, and all the popular libraries we might use so that they produce automatically telemetry information for us. Basically, uh, uh, an application that has been instrumented using open telemetry will automatically publish telemetry data to a telemetry collector. There are several telemetry collectors on the market. An easy one to use is Open Zipkin or Zipkin, which was created by Twitter. Another one is Jaeger, which was created by Uber. Uh, in this example, we are using uh, Zipkin because it's the simplest to, to install and use. Uh, you can download it 
as a single jar application that you can start from the command line of Java dash jar and your file. So super simple if you want to, to give it a try. So the data is published to Zipkin and then one administrator can have a look at what's happening. So how do I enable open telemetry in my application? It's very simple on the Java command line. I use the Java, Java agent parameter to specify the path to the open telemetry Java agent job. Uh, what is a Java agent? A Java agent is a special plugin for the Java virtual machine that uh, can be enabled in this way on the common line. And when you do so, every time the Java virtual machine is about to load in memory one class from your jar file, it will ask the agent if the agent is interested in making changes to this class. If the agent says so, the bytecode will be given to the agent. The agent can manipulate it, return the changed bytecode to, to the virtual machine, and then the virtual machine will really load the modified class. Uh, these agents are typically used by Java profilers, for example, to add code that will sample the duration of your uh, cl class methods upon invocation and produce statistics that you can use to understand if your code is efficient or you would need to optimize it. No? And OpenTelemetry does exactly the same. Then we are telling OpenTelemetry with the dash D common line parameter is for setting system properties in Java. So it's similar to Linux environment variables but only specific to the Java process. So the hotel traces exporter Zipkin is telling OpenTelemetry that we use Zipkin as a collector. And then we also specify the URL to, to Zipkin. And that's it. The remaining is your standard command line for starting Tomcat or whatever application you implement. When you do so and you run your application, for example, imagine a very simple servlet like this one. It, it's, it's really a nonsense servlet, but uh, I wanted to show you uh, that open telemetry supports a wide range of open source libraries. So for example, uh, here we use the OK HTTP client. It's a library to make HTTP calls to other systems in Java. And the only thing we are doing is few lines of code is making a call, a get call to www.example.org slash index HTML. And then we get the content length of the index HTML file and we write it back to the caller. Okay, very simple. So somebody is calling this servlet, there is, and this servlet is downloading index HTML and returning the, con the size of index HTML to the caller. Not really useful, but a good example because if we run this application with open telemetry and we push the data to Zipkin, this is what we will find in the Zipkin console. The invocation was traced and was given a trace ID that we see in the top center of the picture. It's the unique identifier of the client invocation to the server. And then the, the overall duration is half a second, roughly 417. Uh, milliseconds. And how is this time split? Well, the first, uh, you see, it's, it's pretty much like a Java stack trace, no? So the first row is the slash hello, which was the uh, um, URL mapping of the servlet. So that, that's Tomcat. So the, the biggest bluish bar, which lasts 417.800 milliseconds is the end-to-end -end duration of the call in Tomcat. Then the second level is our servlet, uh, which took 200 and I can't read, 63 maybe. And the third level is the HTTP GET to www.example.org. Uh, uh, I didn't have to do anything in my code. I just enabled OpenTelemetry because OpenTelemetry recognizes that I'm using Tomcat and OKHTTP. OK it's able to produce this. And I can see exactly what is happening inside my application. Now, this was the very first invocation to Tomcat you might 
have noticed that the first time you call Tomcat after boot, it's a bit slower than usual because it's loading classes, initializing, whatever. The second call would, would have been much faster, but I captured the screenshot for the first one because it's, it was more clearly visible that we see the, uh, the delta of the time spent in every application layer, okay? And um, this instead is a more complex screenshot from one of the performance tests Auro was running a few weeks ago on one of our microservices. So again, the first row is Tomcat receiving the HTTP, the web container receiving the HTTP request and then delegating to our application. This time, because it was not the first call, you will notice that the Tomcat uh, overhead on top of our own code is practically zero, non-existing. No? In fact, the second bar is as big as the first one. No? And the second bar, which is the overall duration, is actually split into two very fast queries that last uh, about two milliseconds. Uh, then we have uh, one process instant start, which took 242 milliseconds. Then there is another fast query. Then there is an HTTP post to a remote server. Then a blank space and another HTTP post followed by a number of additional queries. No? So at first sight, we see exactly how much time is spent in this service invocation end to end. We can also see that our queries are pretty fast in this example, and that we are spending two thirds of the time in remote HTTP call, and there is a big gap in the middle. What is the gap in the middle? It's CPU time. It's CPU time where we are not using any open source library, just calculation. So the system was not able to inject any telemetry behavior in our code because it's not a well-known open source library. And we have this blank, but we understand how much time we are spending by subtraction in our CPU calculation, right? So very effective and very limited effort. Now we just had to add a parameter on the Java command line run Zipkin, point open telemetry to Zipkin, test the application, and this is what we get. And now what if we go back to the microservices application we discussed earlier, which is made of multiple services, the, the, the Amazon shop. Well, wouldn't it be great if we not only were able to trace the time spent in one service, but to have the full picture of the time spent across the, the red line uh, of invocations, because we said that when, when we pay, our hypothetical application calls the shopping cart to get the total amount for the cart and needs to call the product catalog to get the price for each item in the cart. So it's three calls, uh, two internal to the system, and these two uh, reach additional microservices uh, beyond the one that received the initial request, right? So that is also possible. We go back to our Java command line and we add um, the uh, extension uh, for trace propagators, another piece of open telemetry, and we enable trace propagation and we tell OpenTelemetry that we want propagations to happen using the B3 multi-header, which is the header format used by Zipkin. So was it what, what is it, what, what's, sorry, what is happening now? Basically, when we call the first service and the first service calls the second one, the trace identifier that OpenTelemetry created to trace the invocation within the first service will be included in the HTTP request to the second service as an optional HTTP header. In the HTTP protocol, you can add as many headers you want at the beginning of the request. The headers are just a, a key and a value, okay? On the other end, the second service who receives the invocation is also injected with OpenTelemetry. OpenTelemetry gets that 
header which contains the trace ID and uses the same trace ID for tracking the execution inside the second service. So uh, here is what I can get. Again, totally for free. So in this example, the green one is, the green rows represent one microservice, then in its execution is calling uh, one, two, three, four times uh, another microservice represented by the blue lines. Okay. Uh, in this case, in Zipkin, I can see everything um, aggregated as, as, a, this, as if this was the functionality of a monolith application. In reality, when color turns from green to blue, it's because we're making a remote call to another service. Yet, I can see all the queries on all the systems, all the time spans, and this gives me a complete understanding, a complete drill down of the functionality and the logic across all the services. So if Aura is coming to me and telling me, guys, you, you didn't do a very good job, your performance tests suck, the results are very bad, then I ask Aura, please give me access to uh, Zipkin, no? and, and we start looking into this diagram and we understand that all of that query is behaving badly. Maybe we are missing an index in the database or uh, that service is very slow, but the code looks good. Maybe we need more CPU than we thought on that particular microservice and so on. Everything for free, thanks to OpenTelemetry. And Zipkin can also um, help us uh, understand the interactions between the microservices because it can draw a diagram like this showing which service call which service and the small dots that you see here as static in the web interface of Zipkin would be animated flowing from one node to another and showing the uh, direction of the invocations between the services and the frequency representing also the frequency so this uh, concludes the, the section about open telemetry and telemetry in general. With monitoring, we can understand that we have a problem, but it's also using tools like uh, open telemetry or some other telemetry mechanism that we can understand what went wrong. This is super useful during product development to understand where are your bottlenecks and inefficiencies together with uh, a system that is tested using using JMeter and simulating uh, a reasonable user base, but it's super useful also in production because if your monitoring tool in production is telling you that the application is getting slower and slower and you don't understand why, then maybe you can look into open telemetry and then you will find out that the query that used to be pretty fast is getting slower and slower. Maybe you forgot an index in the production database and your query is doing a table scan. Mm -hmm. no? And the more data people create in the database, the slower the query gets because the index is not there. So not only you know that you have the problem thanks to monitoring, but you also can understand where the problem is thanks to telemetry, okay? And this is all for today, I think, uh, unless there are any questions, I think we are pretty on time. I hope so. Sorry. Stay here. So, guys, let's thank you very much. And for all the effort they have put to come here to give us this talk, to also have fun and gifts for, uh, for you. Uh, as you have seen, it's a, a really interesting uh, piece of technology. There is a lot. Uh, to learn a lot of uh, uh, possibilities for engineering. And uh, as also Georgia has shown you, they are really keen and open for uh, getting in contact with you. I guess with uh, thesis opportunities or also for uh, having uh, a discussion or for uh, having a colloquium with you. So yes, of course. if you have anything to add about this or we invite, we invite all the students to get in touch with us uh, uh, thanks to the email address we have uh, put before. 
Yeah, we will check. I will put the slides on Moodle as usual. So yes. you, you all also those at home and uh, on YouTube uh, will have the possibility to get uh, in contact with uh, with them. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very much. Thank you.